now we're starting. So, um, and it sounds, looks like um, you might, my family right now, they're watching Onward um, on the TV. <laughs> so it might affect the internet connection. Um, you know, the Pixar movie, it came out like, like last week, mm -hmm. but you can actually buy it now. Like Pixar and other studios are releasing their movies on uh, digital formats right away. So, you know, people can watch those immediately. You don't have to go to the theater because theaters are closed. But anyways, kind of wrestling with the bandwidth because they're watching that. So hopefully this isn't uh, too choppy. So one of the things I kind of wanted to go over is just um, your assignments and see how you guys are doing. And we'll critique the assignments that you've handed in so far. And then I also want to look over your um, sketches. Um, so Mary and Randa, they have been uh, putting their sketches into Discord, and which is nice. So I'm going to drag over Discord. So you can hand in your sketches into Canvas, but if you can actually take a picture of it and then just upload the picture into Discord, it's really easy on a uh, iPhone. When you take the picture, there's that icon, it's like a box with an arrow in it and you can select Discord and send it right to Discord. And then I can just kind of do this and I can see the sketches right here. So, um, well, I only sent one to Discord, but the, all the others are in the assignment. Or, yeah, so yeah, I only sent to this. We can do it both ways. I can look into the assignments and then I can uh, look in Discord as well. So mm -hmm. we can do it both ways. And let me look in. I, I brought the exclamation mark like you asked closer to the. Huh. Oh, okay. So why don't we, um, Brandon, why don't we start, start with you? So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the um, onomatopoeia. Oh, Daniel had a question. Uh, what movie? What Pixar movie? Um, they're watching Onward. Everybody's, my family, they're in the other room and they're watching Onward right now. Um, and it just came out like two weeks ago. So after I teach this class, I'm going to go watch it myself. So, Onward. Yeah. I see. Um, so, so let's look at some of these sketches. And now it looks like, so here, I'm going to drag this over. And so here, Randa, yours. Um, so I think you're really starting to understand the concept now. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see with you, you have honk. Uh -huh. And that looks really good. Um, and then quake. Uh, quack. Or is it quack? quack. Wait. Yeah, quite. Can, can you see the duck on the first? Oh, okay, so I see the duck. As a cue, and then the, the feet are the U. Okay. And then the A, it's clear, it's the A, and then C, and then I tried to make the C and the K like the 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 wings, like the, the duck's wing, wings. Okay, that's a little bit harder to see. So I, I think have to emphasize that a little bit more. Yeah. I really like pop. I mean, that looks really good too. Um, and then honk, I like honk a lot. I was saying with honk, maybe you make the K a little bit more clear. And then yeah, the, N, the N is not too clear in between the O and the K, the, the K honk. Um, yeah, you can make the it. N, the N is not. Yeah, a little bit more clear. Uh, let me show you maybe what you could do, let me open up Illustrator. And I'm going to, uh, I'll just go ahead and use the snipping tool to take a screen grab of this. So let me go back into Honk and then I'm gonna use the snipping tool. And I'm going to cut all this here. So I'm just dragging with the snipping tool and Cutting and then in Illustrator, I'm going to paste this right here. Uh, let's see. I'll pick pick this uh, size here. 
and then I'll paste what you got into Illustrator. All right, cool. And then um, what I'll do is I'll just do a quick image trace and that worked really good. I'm gonna hit expand and I'm going to get rid of the white background. So I, I click once on the white area and just hit delete. And now I just have um, your three logos. So I'm gonna take these two and, and just like organize them. So what I'm gonna do is select everything. When you do that image trace, mm -hmm. what happens is it's one vector in a sense, even though they're not connected, it still sees it as one piece of art. So you usually have to go into object and ungroup, and then separate these pieces. So I can organize these a little bit better. Uh, let's see. And the image trace isn't like 100% perfect. So uh, you can see that um, with Quack and with Pop, it didn't capture everything. But I don't know the honk. The thing about honk was I thought that exclamation point was a nice addition to it. But what you could do is take that maybe and then emphasize it a little bit. But I just felt like the word itself would end on like a strong note, like honk. Like when people honk at you, you know, it's usually pretty annoying. And so yeah. it's that like last part of it that always kind of like is jarring and kind of shocks you a little bit. So what I'm going to do here is separate the exclamation point and I'm going to use the eraser tool. So just over here, the eraser tool, uh, shift D and kind of uh, first select it and then kind of go in here and just get rid of that you part. Have, you could have moved the exclamation mark. Well, I have to separate it because the artwork is all connected. I, I have this separate as a separate piece mm -hmm. and then it it's actually two pieces so what i do here is hit shift and select both and then control g and group them and then rotate them so i'm going to hit r for rotate click mm -hmm. again and that becomes the uh, point of rotation where i clicked then i can rotate around and then i'll hit e for uh, transform and then make it bigger. So I was thinking almost doing something like this mm -hmm. where that exclamation point really sticks out. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some, here is a, is a white piece. This was like a leftover piece from the image trace. So you can delete that. Um, I, I wanted to make it like an open, you know, like the honk, like an open, um, you know, I, I mean, I wanted to make it look like that. Yeah, and if you want to emphasize the letters too, you could mm -hmm. always use your eraser to maybe separate them and then uh, that's kind of a... But you wanted them to be connected, right? No, they don't have to be connected. I want oh. it to be readable, but they don't necessarily have to be connected. Oh, okay. I thought you wanted them to be connected. No, the design is up to you. So you can connect them or mm -hmm. you don't have to connect them. It doesn't oh. matter. But if you now, like when you go into Quack, um, yeah, you did connect everything. But the problem is with Quack, you lose the U. Yeah. So I would say bring that U back somehow. Um, the K is pretty cool. I think you're trying to like make feathers. Um, the C is nice. Yeah. Maybe you get like an actual wing and you use um, image trace on the wing. So you do a search for uh, wing and Yeah, the problem with this one because I did it on a uh, pen tool, uh, yeah. it has it had to be connected. Um, well, it doesn't have to be connected even with the pen tool. Um, you know, so you can get away with, you know, drawing something with the pen tool like I'm doing here. 
So you I misunderstood. To, and I thought you wanted to. And then you draw your next letter. So you just have to yeah. close it by, you know, clicking that last point. You click on the first point. So, yeah. you know, I guess trying to show you is that you shouldn't have to stick to one technique. You need to start exploring multiple techniques now to mm -hmm. get what you want. So if you know how to use the pen tool and you know how to use pathfinders and you know how to use uh, mm -hmm. distort tools, then you have this toolkit that you can use to create a wider range of imagery because you've mastered those initial tools. You know, you're learning all yeah. those tools and now you can do a lot more. Like even with this eraser tool, um, going in here and separating pieces. Yeah. And you see, this is the funny thing about the eraser tool. You see how it just worked without me selecting anything. So yeah. sometimes it, it works where I don't have to select anything. And other times it wants me to use the selection tool and select something. Mm -hmm. And I can control the size with my brackets. So right bracket makes it bigger, left bracket makes it smaller. You don't hold anything when you use the brackets? No. It's okay. just the brackets. See, I separated the POW yeah. because it was connected with the image trace. Yeah. And now I can move that aside and then focus on this. And then I can add these wings. So let's say I want to add some wings. I will paste those wings in there for my search. Oops, I don't want to do that. I want to do image trace. Image trace. Um, it's not what I want, so I'm going to go into the um, image trace panel here, and it's over here. And then I'll play with the threshold to bring in more of the, that wing. So if you increase the, the threshold, it will increase the amount of black, so you see more detail. So I increased it. Now I have a nice wing, and now I can um, uh, go into expand, and then get rid of that white part and then uh, select the wing that I don't need. So I'm selecting the vectors on the um, left side and I'm using A for the direct selection tool and kind of selecting it piece by piece. And then um, taking that, maybe goes on top of the C. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it doesn't matter. I mean, there you go. So just experimenting with all the different tools now, um, yeah. push the design as much as possible. You know, so, um, now here I lost the U, so you know, I'll just bring in, uh, you can use any method. So you don't necessarily have to trace it. You can use actual fonts. Um, but if I'm going with like an organic, more of a softer feel, then I want a font that kind of reflects that. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think then I misunderstood you. I thought you wanted everything to be connected and it was such a hard thing to do. That's why it doesn't look like perfect. Yeah, no, no. I just, uh, it's not about, the challenge is not connecting things together. The challenge is readability and assuring that whatever you design can be comprehended by the viewer. So that's what you're concerned about. Your, uh, the objective is to create a onomatopoeia that will be easily understood by whoever looks at that word and that how that word has been designed. So if I can't read the word quack and I can't, if, I, if it's hard for me to understand that this is a duck's head, it's gonna be more challenging for me. So your goal is to assure readability for your client. You want to assure that with a glance, they understand what you're presenting to them. And at the same time, making sure that it has a nice quality and feel to it and it compositionally works um, as well. So, you know, that's kind of your goal. Your goal is assuring uh, readability and making it as easy as possible for your audience to understand what you're creating. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so here I added a couple things. Now, the other thing about this is the duck's head um, should really be a Q. Mm -hmm. and that should be obvious as well. So I think that that part of it mm -hmm. uh, needs to be fixed too. So what I could do is just 
type out Q and then maybe it's a combination of um, these two things. So like you have the beak here. So maybe this Q just needs to have that beak. Um, yeah. That's a good idea to put a letter above it and... Uh... Yeah, so you're trying to... It's forcing you to be inventive. You know, you have to kind of know the software first, really. And then once you know the software well enough, it's like what in this toolkit can you use to express the idea that you want in a way that's um, effective and uh, um, efficient, right? So maybe that, you know, but here too, like, you have to think about not just the letter forms, but any of the elements that's being added to that. So this to me is not the best um, duck bill. Um, so, you know, I can yeah. adjust the vectors. I'm just grabbing points with the um, direct selection tool. Mm -hmm. I can okay. do that, or I can go back and I can find a duck head and then do that image trace and combine it again. Yeah. So I think that one, that one, that's the one that you are having some challenges with where you yeah. can increase the quality of it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But now you're going in the right direction with understanding the what the onomatopoeia is and um, how do you convey that with modifying the type or adding some sort of uh, visuals to the type itself, like with pop, the starburst, you know, so it pops, it explodes, it's coming outward. So that makes sense. Does anybody have any um, comments or suggestions for uh, Randa and what she's created? So I think, yeah, both are, yeah, it's very interesting what you did. So honk, uh, the shape has that feeling. Mm -hmm. um, quack is referring to the shape of the animal. And then pop, the starburst, that explosive starburst gives a good feeling about pop as well. So good job. So let's see um, who else we have. So let's look at some more examples um, of what you have here. So I think for you, Randa, is maybe just kind of um, fix quack, mm -hmm. fix that. Um, make it more duck-like. And I think the other two are looking good. You know, maybe you can kind of finesse it a little bit. Think about the quality of it. Like the letter forms, you know, the, maybe if, if the letter forms start to lose the distinct representation of, of what that letter is, like the P, the stem of the P is getting pushed towards the middle of the, sh of the, um, the top part of the P, Maybe you have yeah. to bring it back a little bit. So just paying attention to those things to make sure that the forms are as clear as possible and to assure that your audience can understand what you're doing uh, with, with what you're creating. So here, I'm gonna go and see who's next. Are you gonna send it back to me or like how do you? Um, I can send it back to you. I wanna make sure that you can um, create what I've done though, so on your own, but I'll send it back to you, but I want to see your uh, improvement. I really like what you did. So I, if you can send it, I can probably work more on it, but I really like what you did. I okay. can work yeah, 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 I'll send it back. Okay, so let's see, Daniel, do you have sketches? I'm looking for a chat response from Daniel. Um, okay, I don't see it, so I'm gonna go on to Charles, are you here today? And I don't see Charles yet. Okay. And Mary, you sent me your sketch sketches in Discord, right? Um, and let's see what Mary's responding. She's responding with a yes. You guys are so shy. Why? Randa's not shy at all. She's like very like, 
uh, unintimidated by this um, medium. And I process. and I know I didn't do a perfect job. <laughs> I know. You need to. Everybody else should like Randa. You, you're setting a good example. So thank you for thank you. Uh, showing yourself to everybody. I don't um, have a webcam on me. Oh, uh, is that Joey? <laughs> yeah. So okay. I had to step out for a bit because I had to begrudgingly add my sister. I had my sister take a photo scan of my face for a project. <laughs> All right. Uh, if I could smile on it, it was nasty. <laughs> so okay, no problem. Everybody has to like come out of their um, digital shell basically and start expressing themselves uh, uh, online. Yeah, yeah. So it takes it takes time. So I don't want to force you into doing that. So Mary, I'm looking for Discord, and here is Mary's work. So I'm going to just copy this, um, and go into Illustrator, and create a new document, and paste them. <clears throat> um, oh, OK. So Mary, so let's see what you got here. Um, do you want to talk for a little bit, Mary, to kind of Tell us what your um, what ideas you you want to focus on. Um, I like the ding one and the bubble one, but I'm not sure about like the third one. Yeah. <laughs> so you like uh, okay, which one? What's is the first one that you like? Ding and bubble. A oh, ding and bubble. Okay, and you're not sure about a third one. Yeah, I might do some more, but those are just some I made. <laughs> So let's think about this for a second. Okay, what is the first one? Is it much? It's much, like the end is, is like in between because it's like scrunching it up. Like it's- Oh, okay, yeah. much. <laughs> and the end is, okay. I don't know if this makes sense. <laughs> All right, that's an interesting one. I like that. Um, and then you have Ugg. Ugg's a tough one. How would Mary, um, does anybody have any suggestions for Mary with UGG? How do you compare oh. that visually? visually? Hmm. I, th I think that's really hard. I just knew it had to be like big, but I felt there had to be a contrast, so like small and big. I don't know. <laughs> UGG? UGG kind of sounds like something that, you know, obviously these are all words that come from the mouth, but I think specifically for UGG, you could exploit that. Maybe well, what is you. What is UGG? Uh, like when you say "ug," what are you expressing? I'd assume maybe you know, groan of some type, like "ugh," yeah. you know, what stuff like that. The choose "ug." It's kind of like um, you're expressing disgust, kind of right? Yeah. Pleasure, like somebody says something like stupid, and you don't <laughs> want to hear it. You'll say "ug," you know. It's like "ug," you know. Uh, so that's a, I mean, that's a good onomatopoeia because. Oh, you know, it's like, it is, the word itself is representing uh, the expression. Um, now, munch is kind of cool. What I like about munch, so I can't, I, I need to think about a little bit. But what does what is munch, what is munch represent? When you, th when you think about munch, what are you doing? Because you kind of express it there a little bit. I kind of see what you're doing. Eating, yeah, like being in between your mouth. <laughs> yeah, so that's eating. So um, to, chew. to chew with steady or vigorous. Yeah, this could be a good one to do because there is that visualization of chewing in the mouth. Um, so I think the problem with the front is that you lose the end. Like, I don't see that end, like, at all. Um, but what you could do with munch, which would be kind of fun, is to um, uh, just draw it out. Like, let's say this is your your mouth, and then kind of drawing some teeth here. Just drawing like. But inside it, you have the words much. Let's 
So you have it in the mouth, you know, and you use that shape of the mouth. So it's kind of like an envelope in Illustrator using a tool um, to actually push it in on the top and push it in on the bottom. So maybe that's a possibility with, with Munch. Um, what's something else that you could do with Munch? This is like my first idea, so I don't know if it's like my best one. So kind of what I wanted you like to inspire you to as you guys work is don't settle for your first thing all the time. Um, so what is something else like that we could do with Munch? If you think in terms of eating, think in terms of the, um, all the types of correlate with eating something. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like I visual, can imagine. Oh, sorry, continue. Yeah, well, it's like vi what visually, what are some of these symbols that relate to somebody eating something? I mean, I think I think the first two things that came to mind for me for Munch at least was at least a food product and then a bite mark. Like yeah. I'd assume maybe a chocolate bar that says Munch, but you know the bite mark replaces a U for this kind of situation. Yeah, exactly. So you have your maybe it doesn't even have to replace anything. Maybe it's actually being taken away from the letters. Then you have munch. And then um, I kind of drew the bite mark first, but let's say out of the M, you know, like it's being gradually taken away from the letter forms. But you do it you do it in such a way where you still can recognize the letter forms. But it's yeah, it's that fight mark, you know. Can we use color in this assignment? Um No. Uh no, I think it's okay to use color. Yeah, you can start to use color. That's fine. Oh, really? You Great. told me not to use colors. Uh, uh, I guess I'm changing my mind a little bit. It depends. <laughs> it depends. If the color, if the color helps um, emphasize and go ahead and use some color. If it, if it doesn't though, and if you're adding color just for the sake of adding color, then I wouldn't add the color. Um, I kind of want you to start using more color, but for the first three assignments, I was like no color. Uh, so if you want to, you can start to think about color a little bit with, with this. It was it, did I say no color in the assignment or did I tell you? Are you talking to me? I'm not talking to everybody. Uh, I sent you one assignment like the night before oh, and you told, me, yeah, you told me you like it, but you didn't want the colors. Yes, because I think on that one, the colors were too distracting and I didn't understand the use of the color, right? Yes. I think what you should do though, this is what you should do, is you should always start with black and white, especially yeah. if it's like a logo. Mm -hmm. Think in terms of black and white first because if the logo does not work in black and white, then it's not going to work in color. I see. How about Guardian? Uh, gradient? Gradient. Have, the goal is with a lot of this too, is to assure that whatever you're designing can be used repeatedly. And when I say used repeatedly, it can be used in several different contexts. So if you're going to design a logo, you want to make sure that it can be readable, but doesn't have access to something that will present it in color. Um, and most likely that can be like, you know, like a print project, let's say. So a lot of times for print, color can be expensive and unnecessary for certain things. So, you know, like, the Nike logo, it works in black and it works in all sorts of colors. 
So a lot of logos are like that. The logo itself will work um, just in black, and then and then the color part is, is uh, secondary. Like, let me show you some some examples of that um, here. So, for example, um, you know, like uh, Time Warner. So here the logo is designed in black first, and then you can kind of see these variations that are in in color. So that's kind of where my my whole um, philosophy is on designing something. <coughs> it's important, and you'll see. I think if I turn to any of these examples, all of these examples will have a black version first, and then it will go into color. Mm -hmm. so you see that? Yeah. Um, this book by Lots of Design, Logos, Symbols, and Icons. Um, it's kind of nice, too, because what I like about it is you see the sketching as well. You see the process that I'm doing here, why I want you to be working on your sketches. That's really important. And you see if there's more. Examples, but yeah, it has to read in black and white first. Like there's the IBM logo that Paul Rand created. That's really important. Um, so I think all of these are going to work as a black and white logo. So this is um, the de development of a logo for Texas Instruments. You kind of see like the thought process behind that. And then like the different variations here. You know, a lot of times the designer will have a whole system in mind when creating that logo and will add meaning to the logo, but it's something that's developed, um, that's developed in like a very kind of like personal way with, with the client itself. So. Um, here's this Texas Instrument logo and this chart representing, you know, what the logo means and the direction that they're going with it. So anyways, that's, that's why I'm kind of like relaxing the parameters saying, yeah, if you feel like it works, um, as a, uh, and with color, then add your color to it, but it has to work in black first. That's very important. So Mary, so. I think Munch is a good one. Ugg, um, does anybody have any idea how we could represent Ugg? So you have to give me a second to think about this here. You know, one of the things that you can do is just do a search, like do, do your research. So I like Ugg. Is that even like spelled? Um, you have multiple U's there. So is that like a different type of UG? There is the UG shoes. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think she, I don't think she means UG shoes. <laughs> Do you mean UG shoes, Mary? <laughs> no, I don't think so. But, but look, I would like kind of like just do like just type UG in your browser and see what you come up with. Um, you know, oh, so this is great. So look, so this is starting to give me some ideas. Um, you know, Charlie Brown here, the hand over the face. Um, you know, the expression that people have, you know, that facial expression. There when you go, so here's somebody who kind of did one. When you what? When I Google something like that, I put animation and that can give me also like a better thing because animation. Oh, that's a good idea. So what do you say? You say, UG animated? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. You know, what is, you know, think of the word too, the origins of the word. So what I would do is type in the origin of UG. 
Now, how did that word, you know, come into being? So it's like the etymological origin of the actual. Word. And if you look it up, it may have some clues in there as you're doing this research. So ug is imitative of a cough and interjection of disgust from og. But, you know, here it relates to ugly, you know, ug, ugly. So what if you made the word ugly? Or what if, um, you know, it's just kind of like this bumpy type, weird kind of mutated type word itself. Um, you know, so there's all sorts of ideas there. So doing that research can help you, kind of uh, inspire you. There is the meaning, uh, because you are, you're looking for sounds through these words. The meaning here, it's in the sound of a cough or grunt. Yeah, like a cough, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's something like something says something like so vile and repulsive, it makes you sick, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting. But that's an interesting part of doing this is how did this even originate? You know, what is the origin of this? So I think that is kind of fascinating to think about. So let's see, let's see. Um, I think that's a challenging one. Bubble, um, that's pretty easy. You know, if you do bubbles, um, rip. So ripping, tearing something apart. That's an easy one too, where when you draw it out, just, um, you know, I think what you could do here is kind of, once you pick your three, work on your sketches, you know, and explore like, you know, like rip, like ripping, you know, a piece of paper in half. So there's my, my rip, but then I can add my letters into that. Um, when I do this too, sometimes I'll divide up the initial drawing and the sections based on the number of letters. So there's R, I, P is going to be in the I. So then I will, you know, add my letter forms here. And then my eye. So the eye will be ripped. It's kind of a challenging one because it kind of almost looks like a B. So maybe I should reconsider that, but you know, so there's my rip. Um, maybe maybe I have to separate the eye completely. So it loses its Venus, the, the quality of being a V, you know, so, so that's, that could be one of rip, but I think these other ones, ooze and swoosh and bubble, those are pretty easy. Ding is interesting. Cause what are you trying to convey with ding? Shaking a little bit. Cause like when you get a notification, your phone, it kind of shakes. Yeah, so you get vibrations, right? Yeah, vibration. Like it's a vibration that you're creating. Like, so when something like you hit a bell, it creates the vibration? Yeah. I what, remember what? you showed us a tool that made um, little like, um, like vibrations on it that you showed us in last class, but I forgot what tool it was. Yeah, so here, so. So I kind of, you can kind of think of that one in two ways. Um, so ding. So here, I'm just gonna change the font to something else. So I don't necessarily like that initial font. Um, Oh, I use this font. So ding. So convert it to outlines, and then you can use. Um, it's under distort and it's zigzag. Is this what you're thinking about? Yeah. <laughs> and then you smooth it out, and then you increase the number of segments. It actually looks pretty cool. Just oh, when you yeah. do that, it has that cool waviness. Um, 
Oh, one of the things you can do too, as you're working, when you have something selected, you have those blue lines, your vectors and your Bezier points, you can hide those. So you can say hide um, edges and then it'll hide it um, even though it is selected. Uh, and let's see, go back in there, um, show as it edges. So uh, control H, if you do a control H, it um, hides the actual original vectors. And sometimes I like to do that just to make it clear, to see what I'm doing. It gets rid of those vector lines that can kind of block your view. And then I can go back and I can adjust things. Um, another thing about the zigzag and these effects, when you see your original vector still, that means that you still have the original vectors there if you need to modify them in any way. Um, but what you can do then, if you do see these original vector shapes, you can go in there and you can change the parameters of the distortion that you created. So I don't know, I kind of showed you this appearance window. So in window, you go to appearance. And where is it at? It's here. You go here and then see how it says zigzag. So appearance keeps an ongoing record of all of your operations. And if you don't expand the appearance of something, you can find them in appearance. And if there's an underline underneath, you just click on that and it brings up zigzag again, and then I can change it. So I can go back in here now. Oh, that's pretty cool. And I can change that. Um, I can modify that zigzag. You're still at zigzag and you're doing all these stuff? Yeah, because what happens is when you apply these effects, these effects up here are what you could call non-destructive effects. Mm -hmm. So non-destructive effects are basically effects that you can apply to your vector artwork and then go back and change those effects later on. That's the really nice thing about using vectors versus um, using pixels for a project is that many times the vectors are non-destructive. Um, you can call that a procedural workflow in computer graphics. It's sometimes referred to as being procedural meaning there's a number of procedures or steps which make up the final outcome, but you can go back and adjust any of those procedures um, later on. Um, there's a, a good example of that are some programs out there um, for visual effects. One's called Houdini. Another one is called Touch Designer. Um, Touch Designer is actually more for VJs. If you're for events, you know, uh, people who are projecting video as they're um, playing music but they use these node-based systems where you can create a procedure or a recipe, but you can change one of the ingredients that you put into the recipe early in the process to change the um, final outcome. So you're not stuck with that final image. You don't have to restart it all over again, which is really nice. Um, the other thing you can do too, is you can create duplicates of things and then go in there and adjust appearances. So let's say you're working for a client and you want to give them some options. They may look at this ding and say like, you know what? It's too distorted. You know, like, oh, like, oh okay, well, how about this one, right? So it's always nice to work in this way where things are not um, destructive because now you can have more variations to show somebody which is kind of nice. That's ding. So I think Mary, Mary, I think that's a good word to play with. That's kind of a lot of fun, a fun word. Another idea of this effect is um, with the word is to take the word and for something like ding, um, it'd be fun to use the radial um, tool. So there's a tool under the line tool Actually, it's called the Polar Grid tool. And these tools are actually interesting. I don't know if I've shown you these tools. Um, so 
you have an arc. So you're just drawing arcs with the arc tool. Um, so if you want to create like a perfect arc, I like to connect them together too. Um, so that's the arc tool. And then in this bunch of tools, there's a spiral tool. So if you need to have something nice and flowing in a certain way, you can use a spiral tool. And the spiral tools, a lot of these tools work with your arrow keys, arrow keys on the keyboard. Um, so what you can do with the top arrow is you can create more rotations or less rotations. And then you can also play with um, control. And what control does, it controls like the tightness of it. So you can create like a really tight spiral or one that's more open like that. So there's those two types of tools. And then there's this rectangle tool where you drag it out and basically creates a grid. But it's just like a series of lines. You can go into um, object and expand. And then you'll get the individual um, lines out of that. It's actually just these boxes that overlap. Um, and then you can also play with this polar grid tool as well. And that gives you this pie chart. And the up and down arrow keys will add um, additional circles into it. And your left and right will add these lines. But what I like to do is um, you hit the left arrow key and you get rid of all the lines that intersect. So now I just have the circles. And then the other thing I like to do with this now is, um, and I'm doing this for Ding, so I'm kind of having fun with this. Um, I have these circles here, and then I can increase the weight, the stroke weight. So I'm going to increase it to give me um, a nice optical effect. Sorry, I didn't notice. How did you come up with those circles? I'll show you again. So it's the polar, it's the polar grid tool, and it's underneath the line tool. So you drag it out and um, up and down adds more circles, up and down arrow keys on the keyboard, adding more circles. And then left and right arrow keys are adding lines to divide it. But I hit the left key a number of times to get rid of all of those lines. Mm -hmm. Now I just have the circles. Nice. And then what you can do with this is increase the stroke weight and then you go back in the object and you go into expand and you expand the stroke. So you just need to expand the stroke. And now those strokes are actually shapes. And then what you can do is take something like this and overlap it on your type and use a pathfinder tool to break up the type based on these shapes. So I can go into um, pathfinder Oh, it was already open, so I'm going to go back into Pathfinder here. And um, first, I'm going to convert my text to outlines, Control Shift O, and then select both. And you can use um, Divide, and then go into your direct selection tool. Um, and then you can do a couple things. Maybe change the fill color. So play with like fill color. Um, but the, the key to doing this is to assure that you don't um, lose the letter form. So I'm kind of losing the D. I might lose the N a little bit. But if I have that like radiation out, I was kind of thinking like when you have a bell and you hit it, the sound comes out in all directions. So that's like part of my ding is the sound coming out in all directions. 
One of the things you can do though, to bring those letter forms back is to divide it up into more pieces. So you, then you can take, let's say a box like this, overlap it, select, and then hit divide again. Um, and maybe do it one more time. Hit divide one last time. So I have a lot more pieces now. Now I got to go back in here and bring them back. And then this might be an example too, where maybe playing with color would help a little bit. And then really it'd take more time to come up with that design that works here. Um, so this one would be more of a process, I think, because I have to find those original pieces. Um, so what are you doing to find them? Um, so what I did here was I also converted, um, or I didn't convert, I used control Y uh -huh. to bring back my, um, just to see the outlines. Okay. Because the, the, the divide ended up hiding a lot. And now you're clicking on them. Yeah, so I'm clicking on pieces and then I'll make these, you know, those black. So this is kind of, I got to think about parts of the letter that I want to bring back. I probably have to bring back, um, I really lost the, the eye. In the end, I really lost that too. But that's using divide to like break this up into sections. I kind of see the end there. So that's just another kind of, I'm just kind of playing with this, you know, just kind of having fun with it. So anyways, bring back more of that I maybe. And here you're kind of playing with the um, contrast too. So maybe that's why. You can also um, play with outlines as well. So. Here. So this would definitely need more work. You know, this is more of a time consuming example, but you know, having it something radiate out somewhere somehow, but you know, this um, it's just another example of what you could possibly do. Um, what I probably should have done from the very beginning with this is select the ding, copy it, convert the outlines, go in here, maybe even use um, Uh, I was trying to use compound path. Um, then grabbing like a bunch of these. <coughs> Maybe doing that. That kind of gives me a good impression of ding. Um, stroke white? Yeah, just uh, stroking in white and then having it radiate out a little bit. But if I have my original letter forms, then I can paste those back. Let's say in the background, 
and then play with the stroke for that. So I can, um, one of the things you can do is you can offset a stroke. So if I go to path, I can say offset path and pick a distance and it um, will offset those strokes a certain distance. And maybe if I only do it like, like two points, hit okay. Um, oops. Uh, I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna hit offset. Here, pick like two or three points. Hit okay, and then um, only have the outer stroke set like this. So now it kind of sticks out a little bit more. Um, ding. So just think, you know, you have to think in terms of readability, it's still kind of about probably need some more, but these are like a couple of variations of ding. So um, I don't know, does that help you with anything, Mary, in your, as you were working on this? Yeah. For ideas? So, so okay. Who else now has, um, let's go into here. I'm trying to see who else has more sketch. Any more sketches? Did you guys, um, has anybody maybe sent some on Discord? Let me look at Discord. So, okay, I, I was hoping you'd have more sketches um, to show me uh, tonight. So, um, this is due on April 2nd. So please work on those um, sketches. That's kind of like the easiest part of this is the sketches. You know, just coming up with sketches that make you think of the sounds. Does anybody else have sketches? Anybody? Yeah, Joe, I just sent it. Emmy? Yeah. I can recognize your voice. <laughs> I only know you by your voices now. Like yeah, once I have class, class in the room again, I'm not gonna recognize anybody except if you talk. Because I can't see you anymore. I've forgotten what you look like. <laughs> so you have to send me photographs of yourself. Um, so Emmy, where'd you send them? Uh, Discord. Oh, okay. So here's Emmy's. Whoops. That's what happens when you cut and paste from drag and drop from Discord. Um, here, copy image. Okay, so let's see what you got. So, what are your? What's the first one? A peacock. Okay, to a peacock. Yeah. So it's R. Is that? Yeah. Like. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> All that noise. Okay. Yeah. That's a tough one. Pop is good. Meow is good. Um. But R is a little bit tougher because that most people aren't gonna like know what a peacock sounds like. Really? Because um, <laughs> I hurt every day. <laughs> oh, do you live like near Rolling Hills or or something like that? Or actually, I just leave the the peacock park, so I just leave around the peacocks. <laughs> so I always okay. can hear the peacock sound every day. You know? Yeah, I know there's peacocks in Glendale too. So um, Glendale? Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So pop, I mean, that's good. That's an easy one. Um, I think the peacock example, I think you have to work on that because there's two things about it. Um, R, I don't really identify that with the bird noise, you know, okay. and plus the bird is getting too complicated. So if it gets okay. too complicated, it's going to be harder to read. So like one that you could do would be squawk um, and just have it in like a bird's beak. You know, let's so do a mm -hmm. walk. Um, and like I was doing with um, with these examples, with Rick, you know, so squawk, like simple, like, 
like a bird's beak, but then you have to throw those letters in there. And then I had divided up. So squawk has S Q A U C K. So there's six letters in there. So I would divide this up one, two, three, four, five, six. And, um, you know, try to make my letters fit in here. Oh, well, that's nice. You know, which is kind of a little, little different. Yeah, I kind of get it. I like to do this thing where I think about the shape and then I plan it out so those letters fit inside that. This K is going to be tiny. Okay, I kind of get it. Like, be easy. <laughs> Yes, but when you s s sketch it, um, this is definitely a hard one to do. I usually like to start with like, uh, like if I'm using pencil, I'll start with like an uh, like a H. So a harder lead. You start with your harder lead pencils, um, and then I work my way uh, down to the softer leads because your softer leads are darker and your hard, harder leads are lighter. Um, but I have this tool that I use and it's this, um, this eraser. So when I draw, what I do is like, I'll start the drawing and I'll start with light, but this eraser kind of works nice because it doesn't fully erase it just fades it out. Mm. So you can find these at like um, uh, Dick Blix, uh, Blix. Is it Blix? What's the art store? Um, and then, um, and then you can go back and use that tracing to help you out. So like, mm. so here's the, the Q. It's probably not the best Q. And then. Here's my S. It overlaps a little bit. And here's my A. Here's my U. Is that the, how you spell squawk? <laughs> It may not be spelled correctly, but I mean, I think it was S Q U U S Q U A W K. You put oh, A. Okay. S Q U K. S -Q no, S Q U A W K. A. Yeah. U A. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Joey. Yeah, yeah. You're like, yeah, yeah, whatever, man. It's all good. <laughs> Sorry, I just, I'm like zoning out right now. So, okay, there's Squawk. So yeah, just like drawing it out like that. Uh, it has like, you know, some lines coming out to emphasize it. So yeah, there's a squawk, at least the beginning of squawk. So yeah, work on your sketches, um, push the idea, make it, make sure it's readable. And when you say readable, not only is the type readable, but the concept has to be readable. So there's two ideas, readability of the word and re readability of your concept. You know, the audience has to be able to read the text at the same time, understand the message you're trying to convey with the image. So you're playing with both, you know, in a way you're yes. turning the text in the image. It's a combination. Are you talking to me? Yes. That's my cousin. My cousin knocked the window. <laughs> what? My cousin came by and visited and knocked my window like, what? <laughs> oh, you have another visitor. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'm kind of, I'm talking to everybody though, 
as a designer, you got to think in terms of readability. You know, does that concept read and is the concept clear, right? And when you talk about it being clear, is the quality good enough that nothing else interferes with it? You know, clarity is important. You know, the opposite would of clarity would be something that is um, unclear or noisy. You know, and noise is um, any type of element that gets in the way of the actual understanding of what you're trying to create. So from an information standpoint, it's um, the noise is helping um, obscure the meaning. You know, it's making it more difficult to read. So you want to get rid of that noise. So that's a way to think about what the readability is. So yeah, I think um, that this, you know, the, the, the two that you have down below Emmy are good, but the first one R is a little bit challenging. That's a little challenging. So okay, work on that one. The cat too. Try to um, when you talk about noise, when I use the term noise, it's the added elements that may be unnecessary. So. Um, you don't have to add like added details to the cat. As long as that we understand that it's a cat and cat-like, mm -hmm. um, that's good enough. You know? Okay. So keeping, um, you know, simplicity, you know, making it, um, you know, minimal details help convey the idea more sometimes and adding lots of details. Okay. Yeah. So does anybody else have any um, sketches to show? Anybody? So, okay. Um, do these examples help you guys in this assignment? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, does everybody, and, and I asked you this time, and everybody has Illustrator now? I think one person didn't. Was it Daniel? Somebody was missing Illustrator. So, Okay, Daniel. Okay, so I still I'll have to make a note. Um, Joe. Yes. So you think the pop and meow is okay, but the meow is too detailed, right? So I just make the make the meow is kind of like simple. Yeah, I think um with with meow, um it's cute, but I don't think you need to have. You can probably get rid of the um the details in the eyes, like. Okay. Um, and maybe the M, you know, so if you want to, you know, but that's where you have to kind of sketch it out a little bit. Okay. Kind of see some of the, um, uh, variations that you can come up with in your sketches. But, um, you know, you have like that cat. The challenge with the M is that the cat looks angry because you have the slant going down over the eyes. Yeah. You know, so it's like. So, what, you know, it's like. Um, oh, okay. I kind of get it now. Yeah, you know, it's like keep it like. Like added details, like you don't really need the whiskers. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to do the pause, I guess you can do the pause. But you don't, you know, it's like you don't need like claws or, you know. Uh, if I add things, it's more ferocious. Now uh, it's even more. Uh, Um, yeah, so it's like thinking about the, the least amount of information to express the point, mm -hmm. you know, as clearly as possible. The okay. less you have to add to express it, the easier the audience is going to comprehend it. The more information you add, the more that it's going to take the audience to read that concept. Okay. Um, 
do you guys understand that idea, that whole concept yeah. of noise? Uh, are you guys familiar with um, Edward Tufte? You know who Edward Tufte is? He has a great series of books. So hold on one second. Let me grab one of his books. Because he really goes into detail about this idea. And I had, he has um, three books, but here's two of them. And one is called Envisioning Information. And um, in these books, I'm getting scared because I think there's like um, bugs, like um, silverfish eating the book, like right there. But, and this is one really well-known book and it's called The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. And it's really about um, um, clarity and not adding too much detail. And his examples that point to this are some of these charts and graphs that are supposed to explain like important concepts, but the artist um, went overboard with the design. So like creating these highly detailed oil wells to show production, um, So he's saying uh, even in the design, they got carried away and then there was errors in the actual information being conveyed. Um, so it's a really great book. Um, the earlier examples in this book are like very early maps and graphs where some are nice in their simplicity um, but others can be confusing because there is so much information being provided. Uh, let me see a good example of that. Um, so like this chart here, um, it's talking about graphics that lie to the viewer um, because there's too much information in the graphic itself. So it's important to think about detail uh, can be overwhelming and not useful. Um, same way with these bar graphs, adding this optical effect kind of hurts your eyes. So it, it really distracts you from reading the actual information. So he, he um, ever tough, he has a series of books that really gets into that detail. So those are kind of interesting. So anyways, um, so I don't see anybody else from your sketches. Um, uh, Daniel, work on the sketches so we can go over the sketches. And everybody have their sketches done for, like I really wanted them done today, but just do this. The sketches are kind of the easiest part of this. You know, it's more of an exploration, but just have those sketches done. Uh, so for April 2nd, you want the sketches, what what we gave you today, or you want something else? April 2nd, it's due, and I want the sketches for March 31st now. Oh. So you can work okay. on these sketches over the weekend, but have them ready for um, March 31st. Okay. And then um, that's assignment five. And then I'm giving you one more, um, I'm extending the deadline for assignment uh, four. So I'm extending that deadline. So assignment four is gonna be due on the 31st. And it's only one picture, not more than one picture for assignment four. Yes, yes, assignment four is one picture. Um, now we can go through the assignment four real quick. Um, and I just, one thing about assignment four is to really push the design. Think about things that you did not explore and try to explore those things. And what I'm saying is there's an opportunity to push the concept a little bit further for some of your ex examples that you handed in. So let me bring up um, assignment, assignment four.
and let me see if something's here. So here's some of the assignment for us. Now, I think a lot of, you, a lot of these are really nice. Um, conceptually, so I, I think you guys are doing a good job with this. So I really like this. This is um, Katie's. And Katie, are you here tonight? I don't see her. Um, so this is what Katie worked on. Um, things to think about. Like when we talk about added information, you talk about what I say is noise. She, I really like what she's doing for Audrey Hepburn. Um, the, sand, the script typeface works really well. There's a playfulness to the typography in, in the words up here. Uh, what's not necessary in my opinion is the outline. So I think that's one of the things you'll instinctively wanting in, to include outlines around things, boxes around things. But if the script typeface, if the letting is um, a little bit tighter, then that form will be readable without the outline. And then here adding, see it's readable. What's interesting is this whole idea of um, a negative space with the, the shoe or the foot right here. So you naturally fill in what's missing, knowing that there is a leg extending, but you don't have to draw a line to show that. So that's kind of the important thing about thinking about like negative space. Um, and there's like a, a nice aesthetic to that by not including it. And I think she could take it even further by getting rid of the outlines. So that's important when you're designing Think about that added information. You don't need the, those outlines. You don't need those um, boxes to emphasize. The content inside can be enough to guide the person to look at what you want them to look at. So she did a good job on that. I think um, it can be tightened up a little bit. Uh, let's see, Rosio. This one takes a long time. I think um, Rosio, um, I noticed with this PDF, you have a lot of type in here. Um, so I don't think, um, I think with this one, it's the same idea. Um, you know, you have a black outline surrounding the ballerina. Uh, I don't think you need it. Like, I think you could just keep, and keep the ballerina in, in white. What I think you should try to do with this is like, I like to see like, another variation where instead of having, and I think this is why it's taking so long for that PDF to open. Did you, um, is this white text on black? Or yeah. is it just white text on black? Mm-hmm. Um, was supposed to have text too, so I think I need to fix that. Yeah, I think, um, I like this idea of having a background that's all text, but I don't think it needs to be white on black. I think you could just make it black type, keep the typography black itself. Um, but I like the script face here. What if you played with like more script faces? Because that really lends itself to the movement of a, you know, the, the expression of the dance itself, you know, the flow of dance, you know, so dancing has a flow. I think the typeface should have a flow too. So It'd be nice to explore a variation of this where you're using a script face. And then um, you don't have to keep it all the same size to fill it in, explore variations in size, but get rid of the, um, the outline to so see how you could go about it with just having the ballerina in white and maybe your black text. And I think it's going to give you a different feel. It'll probably even make the document easier to um, access or open up faster. I think there's just like a lot of text in there um, the way it is. But tell your story still, still tell your story um, the way you're telling it. And then um, uh, make, yeah, make that one change. Um, any questions about that? 
No, I'll work on it though. So, okay. Um, let's see who else. Um, I think it's good that I, I really like the idea. The dancer is a dance. That's a nice quote. So, Thank you. so I think it's, it's a, so yeah, it's a nice concept. Yeah, Randa, I thought this came out really good. Uh -huh. um, again, I love how you have negative space here and you're not creating an outline. So that's kind of the nice thing about um, uh, doing image trace. It will omit parts of the image if you have that threshold down low. Um, but I think that's good because you don't need all that information. You can read it without it. So it works. Um, so I think that's come, come along nicely. Um, I oh, wanted to do like uh, on the face, like the features on the profile. Uh, I wanted to go, I, I didn't like how like the writing was straight, coming down straight. Yeah, now one thing to think about is the direction of writing and adding some variety to it. So you don't have to keep everything in this type of exploration. You don't have to have all the text going from, from the same direction all the time. You can start to explore text going in different directions. Um, you know, be a little bit more, you can be a little bit more experimental if you want mm -hmm. with that. Um, I'm trying to find, I have some examples here. I'm trying to see if I can find some examples to show you of that. Uh, I don't have it. I don't have it ready. Uh, but yeah, you can be a little bit more ex experimental in how you go about it. Um, but I don't know how to to do the uh, tracing, to how to trace like the profile where like the mouth goes inside. You don't need eye. to. You don't need, I think it, the face is fine it's, it's itself. I'll show yeah. you. Yeah, so, so once you kind of get once you have your image set up in a way that's readable, then you can start to experiment a little bit more. So this looks good. Um, mm -hmm. I think this is good. Um, mm -hmm. Just think about text direction and um, I'll show you what I mean in a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I think you're doing a good job. Looks good. Um, Daniel, we'll have to figure out Illustrator. Charles, not here, here. Um, so Mary, is somebody I have yeah. uh, we already worked on this. So I really like what she's doing. So this is a good example for you, Randa. See how yeah. she's having the text go vertical? So that's one mm -hmm. thing to do. Um, the letter forms, you know, having them go off the page itself um, mm -hmm. adds some nice variety to this. So I really like that. Um, mm -hmm. Following text on path, this path going around it, it emphasizes the image. So that's really nice. Um, so I think originally, Mary, you didn't have this white space. Um, this white space was kept intact. And I was like, kind of go beyond the white space, you know, push it a little bit. So I'd like that. Um, and then I like the text on the path to emphasize your image. So I think that's a really nice effect. So what do you guys, what do you guys think about that? I almost feel like we should have kept the original so we could compare it side by side, but um, I think it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks really good. And Vivian, um, uh, I don't see anything from you, but try to get that assignment by the 31st. Knock. Oh, this is really cool. Nice. So again, I really love the um, image trace, what it did but then like the quality of the text and the overlapping of the text itself. What is the word? Does the word have any knock? Are you there? So what is the word? Um, is uh, these here, um, from your name or why you? What are the letters representing?
Are you trying to, uh, so I like, I like the, I like what you're doing. It's, um, and then the really small tax, tiny, tiny tax is really cool and how that creates a texture and decreasing the lighting. And then like the, the words, the bigger words overlapping, even going a lot. So that's really nice. So do you want to comment on this? Explain it. It says actor's last name. Last name. Oh, wait, the actor's last name. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Okay. I see. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, it looks great. Let's see. And Caesar. So, um, this looks really good as well. This is, um, what's his name? What's the actor's name? Um, uh, trying to, uh, Caesar, if he, this is, what's his name? Um, I know who it is, but I can't think of his name right now, but, um, uh, I like this too. What I would think about with yours is size. So I liked what, um, um, uh, Zoe did, so I should say Zoe, um, with hers. So scale, like creating contrast, small fonts and large fonts, you know, having that both, it still works. Um, and it's still a nice image, but maybe pushing it a little bit further. So pushing the design, if you want, you know, taking it one step further would be interesting. Um, that looks good. So I think these are looking good and Chrissy and Luhai. So I think I'll, everybody's really creating some nice work and I like, you know, what everybody's doing. It's just now thinking about where you're at and pushing it even further. Um, that's really important. So sometimes you get to a point, you feel like I'm done and this is good enough. Try to go beyond that. Don't think it's ever good enough. Try to take it one step further. And if you take it one step further and then it doesn't look right, then just go one step back. But I always try to push it a little bit. So I think those are, great pieces and everybody's doing a really good job. So, any questions? So I think everybody's progressing nicely. Um, you know, what's important is to really take advantage of the tools and explore what you can do digitally. I put together this um, quick presentation on digital exploration that I just want to go through really quick. Um, So the whole idea is that you have unlimited opportunity to design things as you acquire more knowledge of the different tools. So it's a progressive process of just learning what the tools can do, all these different tools in Illustrator, and then start to really experiment. Now there's this like interesting history with design as tools progress, artists and graphic designers kind of went beyond the initial rules of, of typography and it took things to another level every time a new type of technology was invented. Um, one of the challenges early on with design is that text and images relay their information in two unique different ways. And the challenge is how do you use them together to create what you want to create? So these two systems are two different systems. And then when you start to combine the two, they sometimes fight with each other. So how do you reinforce information that's text-based and information that is image-based? And the brain perceives of information differently depending on how that information is presented. So text and image um, are read in their own unique ways. Um, so words were the dominant form of communication. First language, then written text, and then images. And throughout history, 
images became more dominant. So with industrial industrialization, with um, photography, with film, with even the evolution of painting, how painting evolved, the image became the dominant form and the text was less dominant. So there was a time where the um, text would, the image would help the text, but now the text is helping illustrate the image. So Roland Barthes is a uh, French theoretician who is highly involved in this area called semiotics, which is the, um, the reading of symbols and signs. And so he says, formerly il image illustrated the text, the image made the text clearer or more understandable. So if you had the word dog, you have a picture of a dog. Okay, I understand that. But now text loads the image and it adds to the image. So it burdens it with a moral and an imagination. And image does not illustrate the text. It is a text which, is amp which amplifies the connotative potential of the image. So with digital technology, you have an opportunity, and this is what I want you to think about as you're working. You know, there's really no final point. You can keep on pushing and pushing and pushing it. Now, eventually the project's due and you have to hand it in, but I kind of want you to always think about how far you can push things. Um, keep the readability, but with the technology, there's really no limit to what you can do but always have readability at backbone that you're always going to go. That's going to always going to support everything that you do. Uh, I wanted to take this example. This is a poster created by Michael Beirut for a design conference. And what I like about the poster is how he's exploring multiple ideas with the text and creating this kind of double, double meaning. So what's the double, double meaning here in the poster? What do you have here in this poster? Describe like some of the things that you see. The direction of the text changes. Yeah. What happens when you, um, you have, what, what do you see in here? So he's, so this is an example of where used to add meaning to the image, but how is that being done? It's the direction of the text. So you have a thumbs up with success and you flip it over and then you have failure, thumbs down. So you have success and failure. You have double meaning in one, basically in one design. But what's interesting about what he's doing too, is how do you, how do you flip the poster? Like if you open this up, what's going to make you flip it? And it's a little hard to see, but what do you notice about the text itself? Like you have to flip it because you can't read if you don't flip. Yeah, it's forcing you to see the double meaning because in order to read the poster, you actually literally have to turn the poster around and read it from all directions. So the way he's like controlling the audience, he's making the see this clever double meaning that he put inside here. He's saying, you know, that success and failure, it's part of everything we do. You know, you don't have success without failure or vice versa. You know, that's part of life, right? But he really wants to convey that because he's taking the text and he's uh, rotating it in a way. It's traveling clockwise in a clockwise direction. First it's upright, then it's sideways, and then it's upside down, and then it's going and the other way sideways, and then it's upright again. So you're, you know, you're turning the poster around, but he's playing with things. He's playing with direction. Um, the poster's balance. So he's playing with balance and he's kind of playing with color a little bit as well. Um, so he's using these different tools. Now this poster, this is, I believe it's from the, um, I think it's from the late eighties. Um, let me actually have to see the, Here's a, another view. Um, yeah, 1987 is the date. Um, so we're talking about a time, um, the 80s was a very important time for publishing because in 19, 
1885, you had the invention of, well, you had the inclusion of a technology into Apple computer and that technology was called PostScript. So prior to 1985, um, you had bitmap fonts where the fonts were actually made up of pixels. Uh, what PostScript did was enable the use of Beziers, which you're using in Illustrator, um, to be used um, in a cost-efficient way on the desktop. So you could buy the computer, you can buy the printer, and then you had the PostScript language, which would let you um, print these um, high quality, uh, the text at a high quality. There was no more bit mapping. So PostScript kind of took away, um, it put it really an end to using a bitmap font in the design. Um, and that's kind of where you start to see this type of exploration, this type of uh, variety, this type of uh, experimentation in the typography and in the design. So, so he's playing with balance, he's playing with direction, he's playing with um, spacing of the text as well. So that's something to think about. So that's something that I saw some of that in your posters, but spacing uh, and kerning, and they're actually two different things. So spacing is the space between each individual um, letter, but kerning is space between certain letter pairs and properly kern letter pairs and credibility of the text. He's not playing with layering as much, um, but you'll see as digital technology progresses, layering becomes an important way for designers to add meaning and information to what they're doing. And that's all enabled through the software tools. Um, so, you know, for balance, I had this example from the group, The Style, and early group of artists prior to World War I, they were trying to just work on art from a very distilled perspective. You know, minimal colors, very simple shapes. The challenge is when you do that, you take away color, you take away shape, then you're really left with working with balance and creating harmony with balancing out shapes and forms. So if you look at work from this particular period, this particular group of artists, you can see that everything is very well balanced and aesthetically you can keep the viewer's interest by creating that sense of harmony with the balance and you don't need color, uh, the minimal amount of information to get the point across. What I like about this next poster, this is from the Dada movement, with, which kind of occurred at the same time. Um, Dada was actually a was a radical kind of shift against what was going on during World War I and the absurdity of war. So the idea was if people are going to go to war and act in that absurd way, then the only way that people can understand you if you yourself are absurd. So using absurdity as form of communication. But what was kind of interesting about it from a design perspective in this new type of experimentation where the direction of the type was explored in, from many different avenues. So you had diagonal type, type going backwards, type slanted, you know, type um, upside down, type that was stair step. So each letter was on a baseline, but went up a, a level to create like a stair stepping type effect. So the Dada posters are very interesting in the sense that they're well balanced, but at the same time they defy typical um, typographic conventions. Um, an artist that graphic designer that was informed by this was uh, Piet Zwart. 
And a lot of his work is heavily influenced by uh, uh, style. And he um, has a certain quality to his work that it's very readable, but at the same time, there's a lot of balance occurring between the letter forms and the way he's overlapping things as well. And what was interesting about him is that he had no um, formal art experience. You know, he started to explore graphic design when he was in his like mid thirties. Um, and by having no experience, he was able to take chances. He was like more uninhibited. He didn't have to follow the rules and conventions. And you have this, um, you know, things that overlap, layering, diagonal type. Um, so very expressive in what he was doing. So here are some of his posters. And this this is occurring um, after um, World War One, prior prior to the World War Two. This is very much Dada influence as well. Um, this work for this magazine spread. And again, you can see the influence. So it's really kind of interesting how how culture progresses and influences the style and the ability for an artist to take chances. Um, here, I just wanted to point out like spacing of your letters in your projects. So spacing is the amount of space between characters and kerning is the process of adjusting the space between two individual characters. Uh, kerning is based on this idea of the M space. So it's calibrated at one one thousandth of an M. So an illustrator, you can kern um, between letter forms and you can add space between letter forms. Kerning really comes to use when you have two letters. Uh, think of like a monogram and you want those two letters to fit next to each other in a certain way. Uh, and I'll put this presentation in Canvas. You can explore some of these links, but they go into more detail about kerning. So a lot of that early experimentation was done in non-digital ways. Once digital technology became available to more and more people, artists started to push design even further. Uh, one of the artists I'm mentioning here is uh, Susanna Litko, and she helped found this magazine with her, um, uh, her husband, and, uh, Rudy Vanderlands, and the magazine was called Immigre. And this magazine came about right when desktop publishing was starting to emerge with the uh, Macintosh computer. And her initial designs were based on monospace bitmap fonts. So you can go to the Immigre website and you can see some of her early work. It's right here, this font called Low Res. So the font was based off of bitmap typography. You can see it down here. So initially, if you ever come across like an early like um, Apple II computer, um, I, I forget the name, the exact Apple computer, but prior to 1985, text was bitmap and it looked like this. Um, it was based on pixels. The pixels made up the font itself. There was no um, Bezier's, there was no postscript. So her designs are influenced by um, bitmap um, typography early on in uh, her career. You kind of see the range. Immigrant Magazine was really um, inspired by early desktop publishing, the Macintosh computer. And so a lot of the fonts um, are clever takes on pre-existing fonts. You could say it's postmodern. Um, there's like this certain attitude about what they're doing. You know, it's a interesting time for technology. The technology itself really allowed artists to push the boundaries in culture, you know, from art to music. And you start to see that in the typography. So there's a whole like thing to be said about digital technology and how it allow, allows artists to create new forms of music, art, and to 
push genres in new direction. So uh, there's more information on Susanna Litko here and some of her work. Um, with the computer and desktop publishing, first you had this exploration of typography going in different directions. And then with Photoshop, artists were able to explore layering more. So you have this like explosion of posters in the early, early 90s that almost lend itself to the whole grunge and alternative music movement. So I have a couple of examples here. Um, and I'll show you with these books. So one is the work of um, David Carson. And this is his one book it's called The End of Print. So this book came out, I think it was like in the early 90s. David Carson um, started to work on a magazine, I think it was called Surf Culture. And then once um, one of the software tools started to emerge, he really pushed the design of his work to a level that was almost unreadable. And I'll show you some of his spreads in this. And really a lot of his work coincided with um, alternative music and like hip hop culture. Um, and let me find a spread that really shows he pushed the limits of readability. You can even see in the book, they add lines going down um, a column of text, scaling things up, blurring things, um, something like this, where I have no idea how to read it, but it's the aesthetic of the text that makes it interesting, how the letters are jumbled together, um, this Pepsi ad, how letters are cut off, how words are cut off in the middle, um, photo collage for Levi's ad. There's one example of his work. Um, some of these logos are really interesting. So the negative space is really kind of appealing, but it's not readable. Um, this is a good example of a spread in one of the magazines. So overlapping vertical and horizontal text. You know, even taking out letters. Um, so very like data is influenced in his work, but even pushing it even further than what the data artists were doing. There's one example where he has a whole magazine spread and it's created using a, a ding, ding bat font. So you can't even read it. You'd have to um, take the font somehow scan it, convert it to dingbats, and then um, convert it, the dingbats into the letters they represent. Here, you know, pushing the margins. So you have text hitting a margin. Um, putting illustrations on, on the text itself, so you can't even read it anymore. So that's the um, experimenting with layering. Um, one more book here I want to show you. Well, are we into InDesign already? No, not yet, because I kind of, because of the whole um, working from home remote situation, mm -hmm. kind of just staying on Illust, but I say the syllabus is kind of being um, pushed back a little bit because um, we lost two days, basically. We lost um, Thursday because it, um, it was like a, um, for the, it was, it, we just didn't have class on Thursday. Yeah. It was a, um, it was uh, for instructors. Yeah. Uh -huh. It was a special day for instructors. <laughs> yeah. And then class was canceled on Tuesday due to the um, coronavirus. So um, we, we have like two days that we're behind in a sense in the syllabus. That's why I'm extending the deadlines um, for the assignments mm -hmm. as well. So. Um, I just wanted to show you a couple of things. This is like, um, this is How Magazine from 1994. Um, so this is a came out, but the cover of the magazine is designed by Scott Mackela. And when I saw this magazine, I bought it um, 
you know, I bought this magazine 26 years ago. I mean, is it 26 years um, since 1994? Is that correct? 2020, right? Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Because if it's 26 so, years later, then, you know, you got the plus six brings you to 2000 and then the 20 brings you to Yeah, yeah. So this is 20, 26 six. years old, this magazine. But when I look at the design of this magazine, I think it was, back then, I thought it was so ahead of its time. And even now I look at it and what he's doing just pushes the boundary so far. So creating this 3D typography, creating the letter forms that like merge into each other, blurring out the backgrounds, 3D text, um, using a scan of skin, fill in the letters, this glow effect. Um, so his work was pretty amazing by what could be done back then. Uh, there was a series of books that came out at the time. So they're just anthologies of this type of design work. Um, so there's David Carson right there in this book called Typography Now. Uh, but this probably came out in the early 90s too. Um, you know, so I think that's more, this is Scott Makala, who I just showed you. But the way artists were thinking about design, uh, it kind of changed the focus. The focus of graphic design should really be on the audience, but they were kind of adding their own personality into the work itself. It's almost treating as if it was a fine art versus a uh, commercial art. So these are some really interesting examples of taking the digital technology and pushing it even further. So I just kind of wanted to show you this. This is 1989, but very Dadaist influence. Um, overlapping text. This is Immigrant Magazine, what Susanna Licko and um, Ruby Vandaland started. But I just want to show you this because I want you to be inspired by the capabilities, what the tools you have can do, and some of the things that you can do with those tools. Um, this is um, Von Oliver. Um, this uh, album cover for the band of Pixies. So this is like one of my favorite bands. Um, but the way things overlap and connect aesthetically to create a sense of balance and push the, the boundaries of readability. To me, it's almost like currently, a lot of this has been lost and we're almost um, too um, politically correct in the way we design things. Um, and it'd be great to see some of this reemerge. But it probably won't reemerge in print. It's probably gonna reemerge with uh, virtual reality or augmented reality in some way. So these are just more spreads. So, um, so this is one of these books that focuses on the layering that was inspired by uh, uh, Photoshop. So anyways, I just kind of wanted to show you this presentation to hopefully inspire you, you know, inspire you with your current assignments. Um, and do you guys have any questions about anything that you're working on? None so far. Okay, so um, so Daniel, I'm gonna ask um, the department about Illustrator, because um, everybody should have access to that um, three month version. So I'm gonna make sure, um, ask about the Creative Cloud. Everybody else has the Creative Cloud, right? So you yeah. all hit yes. Um, so everybody, I can't. I think we're kind of like um, reaching a good pace now with the remote uh, learning. Um, anybody? Um, I think we have a good flow going. So um, hopefully, like in the next couple of classes, um, we'll still be doing the Zoom meetings. But try to be less shy. It'd be great to see everybody's face. Um, try to embrace like the digital culture that we're engaging ourselves in now, right? Because we may have to be inside for a little bit, but I think we're gonna survive. 
um, work on the projects. But I think we're at a point now we you can start handing in the projects in um, on time. I'm pushing deadlines, but I kind of want to keep on going with some more exploration. I want to talk about InDesign. I want to talk about um, um, campaigns, like branding campaigns and integrated marketing a little bit as well. So there's more things to focus on. So um, I think um, everybody's doing great in Illustrator. If there's any questions about anything, just send me an email and I can schedule a one-on-one -on -one, like Zoom session and you can show me your screen. And so that's what people have been doing. They'll show me their screen and we'll work in this one-on-one -on -one session. Um, so if you need help on anything, I wanna make sure everybody um, gets a good grasp of everything that we're working on. Um, is there any questions about anything? So if not, then I think this is a good time. Um, to, to uh, end the Zoom and then try to um, spend some time finishing these projects. Um, and I think we should be good. So is everybody good with everything? Rosio, I see a couple notes. Charles, yes, oh, thumbs up. Okay, you put a no inside your, oh, okay, Rosio put yes, um, okay. So Caesar, is everything going good? Just looking for a text or uh, yes, yes. Um, Joey, everything's good. Yeah, yeah. Any um, Mary? So I just want to make sure. So okay. So all right. So I think we're good for tonight. And um, yeah, sign up for the, um, one last thing is to sign up for, I think everybody's on Discord too. So it's a great way for us to work. If you wanna show me your sketches on Discord, uh, go ahead and do that. And then I can add some comments to them um, to help you with this. And that's all I really have to say for tonight. So anything else? So. All right. Yeah. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, close up the session. I will um, take this and I will, oh, D Caesar, Donald Glover. Yeah, thank you. Um, I will take this, uh, create the video and I'll yeah. post the video on YouTube if you need to refer back to anything. Uh, Sorry if I'm not speaking much. I was like out of it today, oof. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, watch, yeah. watch it again. Tonight was more about me critiquing it and um, providing some inspiration for you with the presentation. Got it's it. less about learning new tools and techniques. Uh, I think I've covered a lot so far in that regard. Mm -hmm. So I think you have a lot of tools at your disposal now. But at this point, I'm just gonna say, um, I think we're good. And yeah, let's um, keep in touch. And then I'll set up the Zoom for Tuesday and just have assignment four done for Tuesday and then assignment five done for Thursday. All right. All right. Thank you, Joel. All right, cool. So, all right, guys, I'm going to say um, See you next week. Goodbye. Try to Thank you. The camera. Have Bye a good Joe. night. Have a good week. And then, if you want, stay on Discord too. And I'm always on Discord. And you can always, we can always talk back and forth because I leave my Discord window open 24 7. Sure. So, so I'm always there. So, all right, cool. All right, guys. All right, have a good night. And I'll talk to you later. You too. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.